how do you feel about being a Jew today when the whole world is saying you're not worth anything? People are taking down their mezuzahs. People are taking off their yarmulkes more quickly. Yeah. I can't put an Israeli flag up without being worried. If you present as a from Orthodox Jew wearing a yarmulke, 77% said no, they don't feel safe going to Times Square. Right. And you're saying that's the trauma part. Well, that's trauma. Now we're doubting. Are we even allowed to exist? We're doubting our existence of its worthiness. It hurts to watch other people say, you're not worth protecting. It is, yeah, it's painful. That's what happens. That's on a, that's on a universal sense. Like the whole, our whole religion, our whole people are being told that we're not even worth protecting, that we're not, like a day after this horrible thing is, they're, they're making uh, big parties in the street. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Meaningful People podcast. It is our great honor to have sat down with Sonny Perlman, or Sonny Perlman, Nisanel Perlman, uh, the brother of one of our previous guests, Dr. Akiva Perlman. Sonny is the clinical director of Our Place, Our Village. I'm sure many of you know about it. You'll find out a lot more about it in the the description, the show notes of this episode. We had a really, really interesting conversation with Sonny about trauma. You know, we touched upon that what's going on in the world today his take is the whole Jewish people, the whole Jewish nation is being traumatized by uh, the world's response to what's going on in Israel. And he has a lot of interesting takes on, on addiction and trauma that every single parent and teenager should listen big because it's very interesting. So we, we're so happy to have him on really, really interesting conversation. Um, I want to thank our friends at Alpert and Associates for sponsoring this episode you know, it's Mar Chesron, and that means we're in between that Yamtu season, right? And you're like, okay, I think we're good. The money's can stay in the bank account, but now is the time where you want your money to grow for you. Money makes money, but money makes even more money when you're working with Moshe Albert from Albert and Associates. So give him a call right now. I'll give you a cell phone number. Just crazy to do, right? Give him a call right now. It's 718-644-1594. That's 718-644-1594. And I want to tell you something about my friends at Town Appliance. Yeah, the one that's been around since 1979. Uh, It was a Thursday night and I was having family over for Shabbos. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a lot of food. I need another fridge. (laughs) This literally happened to me. So what I do, I went to the show notes of an episode of Meaningful People. Real true story, guys. And I clicked, hey, let me just chat with them on WhatsApp. Literally within minutes, I said, hey, I need need a fridge. And they're like, hey, let me just loop in a sales rep and we'll take care of you. The fridge came before Shabbos. Can you imagine? Easy like that. You go to the show notes of this episode, whether it's a fridge or anything else that you need from Town Appliance, they are the appliance store that you need to go to. That is townappliance.com or head to the show notes in the description of this episode and hit that link and you'll be glad you did so. Hope you really are able to gain from this episode. Thank you all. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. And we're here with Sani or Sani? Sani. Sani. Short for Nisano. Nisano. I like That's that. That's what the Sani is about. It's a good choice. Nobody it fits you well. You're what, the Sani or Nisano? Nisani, not Nisano. Sounds weird. Sano doesn't fit anyway. It should be Nathaniel, which is Bronius. nicer. Who does Nisano fit? Nisano Davis, how are you doing? Nisano. <laughs> Did something just make a noise? Is it? What happened? No, we're what? good. Yeah, no. You have no idea. idea. This is our third episode of me. Thing. I grew up here. This is all. Yeah. This is tell, all... Us, tell us about your upbringing. How about that? Oh, like, it's a good. It's a good segue. What's your upbringing like? Straight into trauma. I like it. <laughs> I like it. You guys really want to like. Uh, uh, fascinating upbringing. So, the truth is, I'll talk about my upbringing as it relates to yeah, like sure. why I chose to be so crazy and spend my life doing this work with everybody. Sure. So when we grew up, we, and I think Kiwi mentioned it, or Akiva, what does everybody call Kiwi? Kiwi people call him Kiwi, Kiwi? right? I, I call him Kiwi. Some people call him Dr. Doctor, Perlman. Dr. Perlman. <laughs> Some people. I won't Clients, call him Dr. Patients. Perlman. Dr. Kiwi. Dr. Kiwi. There's okay, a lot of fine. Dr. Perlman's though. There are a lot of Dr. Perlman's? Are there not? Isn't like In my family, yeah, yeah. there's a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're referring to. Okay. There's, I think we're non Not in the world, just right in your now. family, there's a lot of Dr. He's like, just a very popular doctor name. That's what I thought he was saying. Okay. I'm like, okay. Is that like a, is that a statistic or something? Um, so, no, doctor. So, we, Kibi mentioned also, we grew up in a house, which was fascinating. 
in Farakaway, where our, first of all, our parents were divorced, which was right. like the first of everybody. There was no other divorced people. I went to one school, no divorced people. And then the next school, no divorced people. Really? It was the beginning. Then everybody figured out divorce is the best. And they just started getting divorced all the time. No, I'm kidding. That's not what happened. But maybe it is what happened. It's important for people to know that you have a fabulous sense of humor. Well, if they figure it out. <laughs> so your parents yeah. are like trailblazers. Um, so my parents, they were trailblazers. I never <laughs> thought of them as that. They didn't like each other. So... They they called it quits. And that was it. How old are you? But we, I was like seven years old. Wow, you were young. Yeah. Okay. So that was already like that was a difficulty. Like we were the first. We were the first. And then our house also it was a mix between like there was a lot that came with that. A lot of like you have a number of siblings. I understand there are eight of us. Eight. Wow. Yes. All. Yeah. Now yeah. there are eight. They're all therapists. <laughs> no, I don't know if they're all therapists. <laughs> no, but you were seven. Close. We were eight. Now, now you we were have, se you were seven years old. I was seven years old. When they got divorced. Yeah, they, they were like part of a community where you have a kid every single year. So there was- That's what you're trying to figure out. I'm trying, trying to, to figure out how there were some eight, math. You're eight kids. Eight. The oldest at that time oh, you're not the when oldest. they got divorced. Okay. Okay. You're not the no, oldest. No, I'm the fifth. Oh, okay, okay. So oldest was, I think, 12. Okay, and I don't know why I assumed you were the oldest, but okay. Or, or 13 or something. Like 12 or 13. There's between there were eight kids between twelve and thirteen, and then and then um, my young the, yeah it was like twelve year gap eight kids yeah single mom I got so you. that's where we were growing up and our house was also like became like the first Arab place I don't know how yeah. to explain it different like my mother had like a thing where she just let all these uh, teenagers like come and pause no, what pause Malcolm Poznanski Malcolm Poznanski he's younger than me. He grew up, he's friends with your brother. Yeah, but he. I think they met in Israel. Oh, okay. I think they met in Israel. You guys have him on yeah? We yeah, did, yeah. Okay, he's awesome. So like, so Menachem is you my each other. counterpart oh. in our place. Just letting you know. I have regards to you from him, by the way. I, I ran into him on the street oh, nice. a few minutes ago. Nice. I pointed as if he's still standing there. And he's you look, right, he's, looking he's not like, there right now, okay. <laughs> but I just bumped into him on the street. So he's, yeah, so he's doing this a really long time with me, but I, I don't think they knew each other until Israel. Because oh. Menachem grew up like in L.A. or something. Does Did that he, make sense? Yeah, no. I, but I think he lived in Farakway also, no? He, at some I grew point. up in L.A. You might be confusing him with me. No. <laughs> we just met. <laughs> I thought his family started there. Maybe I'm wrong. Mi no, I'm in San Francisco. San Francisco. San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not wrong. No, you're right. Okay. You were wrong about Los Angeles. I was, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> By the way, we're in New York. People I know, people so, in New York assume like California San Francisco is like a little shtetl. And L.A. Used to be its, it's own country, thing. by the way. Yeah, no. San Francisco and L.A. California Republic. It's the same thing. <laughs> You're all though? out of town. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. It goes uh, tri-state and then everybody else. Yeah, you should know for that. Sure. But you have a lot of LA pride. I like that. Yeah, I like that. You got to. I was in LA for two days of my whole life, and it rained for both those days. Wow. And ever and it was in the summer. Huh. Which everybody was, and I hated it because <laughs> I was like, I I wanted to go rollerblading on Venice Beach. Sure. Which I know is not as cool as it used to be. That no, now it's like a little bit. Rollerblading is not cool. Now it's like a homeless, at all. like getaway. Yeah, Venice is rough now. Right. It's the world. So anyway, we grew up like that. So there was a mix of like difficulty of growing up. And then, you know, my mother was a great mother, but she's trying to raise eight of us. We were all pretty psycho. And we had all these other people in the house. Like we got this, this feeling that this is like, we're on a mission to help the world. Yeah. But also, we all had our own stuff, like our like. So, it's almost. I almost just. I don't know if this could go completely off, but the Spartans, like they had the greatest warriors. Ever. Roman Empire. Roman Empire. Yeah, it's it Greek. Is. It's oh, Greek. okay. Okay, we're going back. <laughs> we're going for the. We're going for the back. But the Spartans, the first five years of Spartan life, it's they the same would, perspective on on European countries, by the way. Yeah. Like what New Yorkers think about California cities, <laughs> cities. It's about the whole Greek Empire European and countries. Rome, yeah, Empire, Rome, same Greece, same thing. But the way they would do it, I, I'll give it. I don't know why this this is coming to my mind, but I'll tell you because my mind does this stuff. But basically, in the, when the Spartans, the first five years of life, they live with their mother. It's like unconditional love, like enormous amounts. And then they would rip the kid away and throw him into an army camp where they never saw their mother again. Well, huh. So it was like the perfect, I don't know why I'm sounding very depressing for starters, but they made the perfect warriors like that. Like it was like the perfect mix they were of just like cold, confidence yeah. from their mother 
and and fierceness from being pulled away and put into the father's warrior camp. Huh. So it's an interesting marshal to do in life in general, but that's how it was with us as kids. Like we had the mix of like trauma <laughs> from the difficulties and the love from the, like w- how much we were like offering the community and like we had a sense of mission as kids. So that's why we all became there. It's interesting though, because like I find that I- there's so many times, especially in the seat that I'm sitting in over here, that I have guests that I'm like, man, given your circumstances, it's like so many people who have had early life challenges turn out to to do something that really affects the world in a big way. Right. And I find as opposed to someone who like had a very just like power of neutral, uneventful upbringing. Right. Any reason why? <laughs> yeah, I think it's hunger. I think uh, I think if you had a decent life, you, you just want to live a good life. You're not hungry to prove something or be validated by the world or to make what you went through more meaningful. So I think that's is actually Joe Rogan <laughs> that you yeah. mentioned before. He's always say that his favorite people in the world are people who went through major difficulties. Yeah. But then we spend all our life to trying to make our kids have these perfectly wonderful lives. Basically, they're not going to be our friends when they grow yeah. up. You know, like our favorite people are the people that went through all the difficulties because yeah. that turns, it gives so much character to somebody to like when you go through that stuff. One of my favorite quotes so. is from someone you know well, Dr. Akiva Perlman. He said here on this program, he said, I'm quoting your brother in front of you, your, your younger <laughs> brother. He said that some of the most beautiful people he knows are, are, are some of the most wounded people he knows. Right. I mean, that's special. Well, I just, so I actually just for homework to come on this, yeah. I was like, oh my God, I better watch a couple of episodes. Yeah. I didn't get through a couple of episodes, but I like scanned around and you had Joey like Roosevelt. two years ago, or yeah. something like that, a while ago. And uh, he said, he quoted the Kutzker where he said um, that the, the most, ah, I forgot the quote, but it was the most full heart is a broken heart. Yeah. There's nothing more, um, there's nothing more whole than a whole broken than heart. a broken heart. So that, what, what does that mean what to you? Is. What does that mean to you? Well, in davar shalem kid lev nishbar. Right. For so, our, for our Hebrew listeners. Yeah. Well, actually that could help me segue into like a little bit more of like what I'm doing now. Yeah, for sure. Is because a lot of times we're trying to take something that's 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 um that's normal and pathologize it and turn it to something not normal. Like everybody's like, oh, you work with addiction. That's wild. You know, like, you know, how can you explain addiction? And when I explain addiction to people, they're like, oh, that's me. And that's everybody. I don't think I can explain addiction to somebody without them saying, oh, I totally get that. So explain addiction. Um, So I'll explain it. What I was saying is that we have this idea of a perfect, like a perfect life. We have a perfect life and uh, that's what we could have. And it doesn't really exist. It doesn't really exist. But the best way I explain addiction and my like goal in life is to like be more like Rashi than Tysus, you know, like Rashi like tries to take everything complicated and make it as simple as possible. Yeah. And that's like my goal. Like if I could use less fancy words, um, you know, it makes me look a little dumber, but, but, uh, <laughs> I think Momo's the opposite. <laughs> oh, yes. Hey, right. You could, I know Shoot the fancy words. Micro. I skip the fancy words to try to make it as simple as possible. But the best way I can describe addiction to, to anybody is that inside us, we have, what we call self-esteem, which is, um, which is our ability to cope with the world. And I could get further into self-esteem, but the idea is that, Life happens and then we have to deal with it. So we have it inside. When we don't have it inside, we can't deal with the coping. We have to use something from the outside. So, you know, like some people, you know, like they'll watch Netflix for five hours a night just to heal, just to deal with the difficulties. The more you have inside to deal with your stuff, that's less addiction you have. The less you have inside, the more you have to use an external self-esteem, which is what I call it. So like take an outside self-esteem and I am borrowing esteem from the world. The less I have inside, the more I have to borrow from the outside. So we're all trying to cope with the world and make the world work for us. But we need to either use the outside or use our inside. That's the whole thing with, with addiction because an addict is someone who has nothing inside and they will spend their days being addicted to alcohol, drugs, behaviors, 
all these things and every time is like i'm only addicted to alcohol it doesn't exist right addicts are addicts it's, it's, a person, it's like a personality it's like a i think it, if you wanted to classify addiction properly it would be closer to a personality disorder than it would be to any other pathology and you, you think everyone has addiction i think that addiction is a spectrum and we're all on it so the healthiest person in the world will never like you know they say what the healthiest this is like see so like what's the healthiest if someone gives you a compliment or an insult and you feel the same way you know i don't know if you ever heard that I never did that's, that's okay so like someone who has a perfect self-esteem and is fully understands that they are worthy of this world you can't hurt them like you can't say something that's going to hurt them. that's enough. healthy that's the healthiest self-esteem you could have they're not i'm not saying you want to hang out with that person <laughs> you don't why those guys are so annoying they're just not fun they're not fun they like they're totally self-contained they're, they're corporate great. <laughs> oh, they're almost as bad as hanging out with the full-blown addicts it's like oh gosh saying it's you, two extremes yeah it's very very extreme but the highest level you could get is that i am so worthy that nothing could bother me i just can't get bothered so you could get to that level or you could get to i am so not worthy i have nothing inside that Every single thing literally tears me to shreds and I can't function at all. Like the pain is unbearable and I can't deal. The core of all addiction is the deep belief that I am essentially unworthy. That mm. is the core. Now, everybody fits on that spectrum somewhere. Like my goal in life is to be like 70-30. Like if I could get a 70-30 day, I'm very happy. Like I'm feeling more secure about myself that I don't need to borrow so much. I don't need to walk into a room, make everybody happy with me. Like, you know, an addict, this is one of the examples of an addict is I'll walk into a room, there's 20 people, 19 of them will think they're awesome. And one person will be like, mm, I don't like you so much. That'll ruin their day. Sounds like Haman HaRasha. Haman HaRasha, why? Calls that in Aina Shavali because one- Mordechai didn't bow down. Right, one, one Jew, guy. One guy wouldn't exactly. bow down. He was an addict. That's addiction. Really, I never heard that, addiction explained like that. It's a very different approach to addiction because I'm watching, first of all, the addiction community is like, there is a magical thing, addiction. Like this guy has addiction and this guy doesn't. And, but then I'm finding people all over the spectrum. So I get a full-blown addict. A full-blown addict will have a, like he, he'll be living on the street on Skid Row. Now, quote, no, it's your <laughs> area. LA reference. Why are you I just have my LA pride right now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> on Skid Row. Skid Row, which, by the way, most of LA is Skid Row right now. <laughs> but okay. Skid, um, Skid Row. You're living on Skid Row and you have no way to function. And all you got to do is find that next drug. Or, or, you know, it's you literally have nothing in you. That's, that's, that's a full blown addict. But then I have people who are living their lives, they're, they're fine. And then, for some reason, they're going off and cheating on their wife three times a week. Like, why do you need that? Like, what's happening? Now, he's, he has a job. He has his thing. He's doing all this stuff. And like, There's something in him that is so incomplete that he has to do something. I mean, I don't know if this is a podcast I could say that in, but I'm saying. But I, I'm you saying, just did. I just did. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. I should have asked you before. No, it's all good. But what I'm saying is that we are all there. Like when we have, there are nights where I'm like so wiped out from work and I start a, a show on Netflix and, and I finish it. It's like five like in the not, morning. Not, I'm looking outside. I'm like, not the episode. I the need season. to check myself into the rehab, you know, like the yeah. season. I'm not oh. talking about, it. you know, like that's happened. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. wow, my insides were really empty. But I'm not going to go and shoot heroin on the corner and throw out my whole life. That man. would be empty. Then it'd be emptier. You're that's saying. much more empty. So uh -huh. what I'm saying is like, how does it make sense that you have people all over the spectrum, but there's like a, there's like a, like a special thing addict. How do you make sure you don't get so empty? So that's, that's the, that's, that's, okay. So that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the third. No, no, secret? no. Cause there's more, it's the question. So there's a much bigger question. We'll be right back to this episode of meaningful people. Um, but I want to tell you something about our friends from okclarity.com. And this happens to not be an ad. They're not a sponsor in this episode. Uh, we've shared about okclarity.com in the past. You know, the Jewish community's number one online mental health and wellness directory. And you know, you know how much I personally love their work. Well, today I want to let you know that okclarity.com has done something unprecedented in response to the war in Israel and the trauma that we feel as a result. 
Dozens of their featured therapists, psychiatric medication providers, coaches, and nutritionists are offering their services for free or with a generous sliding scale for anyone directly or indirectly impacted by the current events. If you or a loved one would benefit from this, please email support at okclarity.com and they will share this curated list of providers with you. The links and email address will be in the show notes of this episode. Wow. You know, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of chesed that's being done in the Jewish community over the last few weeks. It's really incomprehensible. Um, and OK Clarity is, is throwing their, their name in the hat over there. Uh, free therapy potentially for you. If this is something that is something you need, you're going to go ahead and email support at okclarity.com right now. Now back to this episode. It's an interesting framework that yeah. you're, that you're outlining. Right. And I've heard something different and I'm wondering if it's the same as what you're saying or, or, or if we need to reconcile it or maybe not. Maybe mm-hmm. it's too Hash it out, Momo. Maybe it's competing Let's go. views. Let's go. I've heard an expression that every single human being on the planet would benefit from living a life of recovery mm-hmm. and addict's life depends on it, right? So if an addict fails to get into recovery, there's, there's no life at the end of that. Right. Whereas saying, but there is a disease model to- right like to the Parsha of addiction. And I understand that from guests that we've spoken to here on the podcast, that empowering people that are struggling with substance abuse or behavioral addictions to empower them to know that they do have a disease and to empower them to let go of some of that shame and to embrace the solution is a helpful step in that process. And I'm wondering if you're saying something different from that, like dispelling that there really is no disease that we're talking about, or is it just more of the same idea that everyone can benefit from this ideology of recovery and having a sense of self-esteem and not taking external forces to fill up oneself and everyone can benefit from that? Right. But are there truly no addicts or non-addicts? So I, yeah, it's not, technically it's not, it's not what you call a stira. It's not, so they're not, they're not arguing with each other. Only thing I would say is that as you get further on the spectrum, it looks more like a disease. Now, there's no real way to say addiction is disease because a disease is something you could detect in a body and you could be like, oh, this person has this disease. You can't detect addiction in someone's body. Maybe they have arguments that you could look into their brain. There's a genetic component. I'm not saying that stuff doesn't exist, but it looks like a disease and it acts like a disease. So where does it act like more like a disease? As you get, when I, when I, when I talk about someone who's like 75% addict or higher, that's the same thing as what everybody else is calling an addict. Mm-hmm. Only thing is I get a ton of people that are 50 to 75%. They go to 12 step meetings. They don't know what they're talking about. They're like what, They don't qualify. You, you, they, they, they don't even understand what they're talking about. You, you telling me you abandoned your child at the, at the corner because you had to go get alcohol down the store and and you, and like the stories you'll hear a guy lower on the spectrum who needs the same help is just not understanding what they're talking about because they're so empty that they're literally willing to throw away every value everything they love everything they care about and they do it's not like an addict doesn't have values that they care about and love they love their family. They love their religion. They love all their stuff, but it's not doing it for them. So they need to use something for addiction. So I'm not disagreeing with the disease model. And I use the 12 steps in my programs to, to, to help people grow because they're incredible and they tap right into what's needed. But I, I don't know if that answers your question pretty much. I think it does. But I want to go back to Nachi's question because Nachi has a question. I don't remember the exact question, but the the it's a bigger question because the real question is if you go more universal, like yeah. why is it so rampant right now? That people are on like a hundred. It, it, well, first of all, people are on a hundred, but not even like a hundred. Like it's so hard to meet someone who's just all right. Like, well, you know? What is all right based on your like definition? Based like- on my definition, that they could able to deal with the difficulties of life without falling apart. That's all right. And without turning to That's external... Right, so if yeah, you turn to, to some external, external sources, just in moderation, that, right? that's right. what you're saying? Yeah. Like you can watch an episode, just not a season. No, I say a guy who's, it's like, it's almost like no one could handle any pain anymore. That's, that, that's what seems to be going on right now. Really? I, when you meet people on the street and, and like, oh my God. The fragility. I, We're very fragile. Yeah, so the word 
it could be fragile, but there's some, it's go, we're not it's resili- we're so, not resilient people now. What? We're not like, you, you don't think from your- We don't res- have resilience. It's very, it, that's what I'm saying. Like I walk in the street and I meet people and they're like, I'm not, at least I'm not an addict. I'm like, you're literally falling apart daily. And I'm, I'm not only talking about other people. I have this also. There are right. times I have weeks where like life is just killing me and I don't right. seem to have the strength to pull it off. So I've seen a lot recently with, with what's going on in Israel. Yeah. Um, especially right after, you know, right after Torah and that stuff happening. I, I've seen so many people completely fall apart. You no know, people who stopped eating, can't sleep, can't, can't function, cannot function. Now, given the things they've heard and seen and all that, you might say, okay, well, that's, it's normal because what's happening isn't normal. Um, but are you suggesting that we have to be a little more resilient with our response? I think we have to be more resilient, but, and I, I mean, but in a situation where it makes sense, I mean, like a client comes to me, like I haven't done prior practice in a long time. Mm-hmm. I'm actually, I'm doing programming and that's what I do. And we'll talk about it. Yeah. But, the client comes to you and they're like, I don't know why I'm feeling sad. I, 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 you know, I have a, you know, like, why am I sad? And then they tell me they just moved their house. They got divorced. Their brother died. They, I'm like, you're sad because your life is hard right now. Like, it's called normative. Like, you don't need to analyze or pathologize. You don't even have to go on. If you want to take some meds, it's up to you. But I'm saying it's, it's normal. Right now, what we're experiencing with Israel Everybody should be feeling really, really sad. Now, the healthier we are, the quicker we'll bounce back. What does that bounce back look like, though? Well, it could be like you have. I, I had the other day. I just, I just feel like I can't handle anymore. I've been on online, and yeah. I had, a, I did a podcast with my sister, who in Israel, and just hearing that enormous amount of pain, and now the world. Like I put a couple of videos out, and and I got like a lot, a lot of hate from the Palestinian side and stuff, and it started eating at me. Right. So like uh like two days ago, I'm like, I I can't handle any more emotions. Like I, I gotta <laughs> shut this down. I was in the th- I was in the throes of it last week and I was on like social media and I got added to like a panel of like, you know, the Israeli conflict and like I was on the panel and there's like three pro Palestinians and me and like two Israelis and it was just like I, I, I also I couldn't couldn't handle it. Like the things that people are saying, like, and honestly, I, I feel like this is something that a lot of people see. If they're online, you're seeing people protesting in the city with Palestinian flags and pro Hamas flags. It's like your mind wants to explode. Like, right. how are you? How is it possible? But at the same time, we're human beings and we have to be able to express that emotion and not just completely fall apart. Right. Well, what do we do? Okay. So let, let me, let me, let me pull back and turn, talk about like, my philosophy of what's going on sure because because if you if you understand i built a whole program based on the philosophy that that we i've developed over years and years and years because and the struggle i had was i constantly sending people to rehab sending people to to therapy something and and then literally having relapses and people not making it people spending a hundred thousand dollars on rehab and then someone comes back and they there was something missing in this whole process of trying to heal people, that didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. And what I discovered is that they, what they were missing was community. So I'm giving the answer because that's what I believe, the community is the answer. But what is exactly happening is that the self-esteem is made out of two things. It's made out of worthiness and competence. Those are the two things what we have inside us. And worthiness comes from, I am loved. And that's the belief of I am loved. I am worthy of being here. So whatever happens to me, I'm all right as a person. I'm not a bad person. And competence is I could do it. So the way I see it is like the worthiness is like is the gas tank and competence is the car. And you can have the best car in the world. If you don't have worthiness, that's the gas. You can't drive that car. We get worthiness really in the beginning of our lives from like unconditional love from let's say your mother, your father, you grow up. There's never a place where you're not feeling love. You could you could be barfing on them and making duty and doing whatever you want, making it, you know, you guys have kids, right? Yeah. I mean, there's no unconditional love like the first year of a kid's life where you get no sleep, you get nothing. And you, no point you say, oh, I can't stand this kid. You know, like that's that's what happens. So we fill up that love early on in their life, which is this, that no matter what they do, they're loved. 
and we tell them about Hashem and your love from Hashem and your love from this uncle and this aunt. You just, there's a tremendous amount of love. And we, we internalize that love and then we walk around with it for the rest of our lives. And that's As, the from, from like a baby? That's from a baby. That comes like, even if you study Freudian stuff, like it happens really Subconsciously. Young. It's all subconscious. It's being like dumped in. I mean, we describe, we describe babies like, right. it's nurture. We describe them like sponges. They will suck everything in. To what will. age? Like what age does it start and end? So is big machaikis with the with the with the therapist. He actually, that's <laughs> it a question. ends on February thirteenth. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a question you got to ask Kiwi. I, I will tell you that because <laughs> Kiwi is the professor, and he'll give you exact age. Hopefully, Fre it doesn't end. You know, Freud yeah. is saying two years old. Erickson says five years old. Everybody has like a different sheet of when it ends. What I think is that it's consistently going on throughout our life. Mm. Meaning, we could fill our tank, we could have a strong tank, and we could move through our life. And and we have to constantly fill it. You can't go through life without it being filled. It's like the poker chip thing, right? You know what's the poker chip thing? The video the kid who has we how many times we said this so many times in this podcast. No, and by oh, we you mean myself. Uh, <laughs> I think one, I know the poker chip thing. One, one, <laughs> are we though? Are, uh, are we, we though? <laughs> yes. Um, the poker chips, you know, like you making like deposits, kind of like yeah. Billy goes in the bus and and he's got like he's got like five hundred poker chips and his like self esteem. The bus driver calls him a bozo and boom, he loses four hundred poker chips. Right. He goes home. His mother makes him a hot, beautiful dinner. That's a thousand poker chips. His father yells at him and calls him a waste of life. He loses five thousand poker chips. And life is just about making sure at the end of the day you have more poker chips than like you're not in the negative right and like that so that that is a beautiful marshall i do like it I, mine is a little more complicated because it's <laughs> no because the way i see it is that you could fill up that tank yeah right and you have a lot of poker chips you could be getting a lot of love from all directions and this is where trauma comes in because the more trauma you have the more addiction you have it almost equals perfect if you I, mean, I could get into the studies, but I'm not going to. Why not? What I, because they're boring to me. <laughs> okay. But I looked up the studies. And I, <laughs> I've seen them all. But I will tell you, because again, I want to be Rashi. I'm not looking to the whole like the 10 years of explanations. What They're boring to me because I want to see it as a picture. And as a yeah. picture, it's a tank. And in that tank, it's something like a trauma. Trauma tells you you are not worthy. If someone touches you or does something bad to you when they're supposed to be loving you, then you start questioning, well, well, am I worthy of love? That is the question that comes from trauma. Like well, why, is that, why is that the question that comes from trauma? Well, if so, and also trauma is like, uh, what's happening now is traumatic for people. That makes them ask, am I, am I worthy of yes. love? Matter what's of fact, you're thinking about it. I'll tell you why. How do you feel about being a Jew today? When the whole world is saying you're not worth you're not worth anything, I feel very very pr uh, prideful of my of my Judaism. I'm very upset about what's going on but in the it world. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts what's going to on watch other people say you're not worth protecting. You the, the fact that it is Palestinians. Yeah, it's I, that's what happens. That's on a that's on a universal sense. Like the whole our whole religion, our whole people are being told that we're not even worth protecting, that we're not <clears throat> like a day after this yeah, horrible right. thing is, yeah. they're, they're making uh, big parties in the street. Imagine you're a little child and and uh, I, 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 somebody hurt you, right? Let's yeah. say an abuser. And the next day, your parents were hugging them and loving them. And they like, that's the experience of an of someone who's traumatized is that they're, they're, they're being hurt and being told, I, you don't need your own personal space. I could take your personal space. I could, I could bully you. I could molest you. I could do all these things to you. And then a kid, as a kid, just starts thinking, well, if he's allowed to hurt me, she's allowed to hurt me, and they're allowed to hurt me, well, maybe I, I'm not worth not being hurt. I mean, like, that's the idea. The idea is like, but I don't think for a second that, well, the Jewish people are not worth being protected. I think it's, ridiculous what's going on i don't well think. the world is telling us that. well i don't but you, you believe it you're being strong you think there but as a little child okay, if you were so a little child and you're four years old yeah and the whole world is saying you're not worthy like i'm allowed to touch you when you don't want to be touched i'm allowed to do whatever i want to you you're not protected and i don't need to protect you and you tell your parents your parents are like yeah it's not such a big deal you know, like they're, they're pushed aside. This is how trauma works. And you start building in your head, oh, maybe I'm not special enough. And I'm not. And by the way, it is happening because we see the Jewish people. Jewish people are siding with the Palestinians. I see it all over the line. They may not be Orthodox Jews, but I'm right. saying, they're, how 
Your right, people a- were just killed, and you're say like they got convinced by the world that we're allowed to be hurt like that. That's a trauma of a nation, in my thinking. Really, I, that's what I think. We're being traumatized. I feel it. I feel it. Not only do we get hurt, but we're being told by the world that we deserved it. Shami Rahim. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get so dramatic. No, but I, but I, I think it's a really that interesting feel like analysis trauma? of the. I do. I agree. It's trauma, yeah. but like. I don't know. I I'm I having a hard time with your struggle identifying the the traumatic experience. He's that, saying the tr- that trauma, Sonny is right? Describing. I understand your response, which may be correct as a healthy response to what's happening. And you know, if someone is after something that you have, that could reveal that you must have an asset. That's a beautiful way of thinking about it. But how could you not appreciate? the the sensitivity of what Sani is describing certainly it's experienced as a trauma when we're being persecuted and murdered and people are saying that that's okay yeah but i what i'm saying is i i i could be wrong i don't feel that the reaction of people who are traumatized by what what they're seeing what's going on is the feeling of maybe we're just you know like i don't feel loved i don't feel protected their failure to articulate it in those terms doesn't mean that that's not what they're experiencing. They're experiencing it. right now as as the world stands. I don't feel loved. I feel like we like I'm starting to doubt whether you have to treat Jews well. People yeah, are, no, I people agree are taking down their mezuzahs. People are taking off their yarmulkes more quickly. Yeah, yeah. and that's this is the term like that I can't hang up. Like if you tell a child, like you know, like don't show your face. Like I can't put an Israeli flag up without being worried. Yeah. I took a poll. I did a poll on Twitter the other day Mm -hmm. about if you're from Jew and you, do you feel comfortable going to Times Square? And 77% of people said, no, if you, like if you present as a from Orthodox Jew wearing a yarmulke, 77% said, no, they don't feel safe going to Times Square. Right. And you're saying that's the trauma part. Well, that's trauma. Now we're doubting. Are we even allowed to exist? We're doubting our existence. So what's, the fallout, what's the fallout going to look like? I'm not exactly sure. I'm not exactly sure. You're going to be really busy, maybe. I, I'm going <laughs> to be you, busy, but yeah. I'm talking about a big nation. But I'm talking about, let's let's bring it back to a single yeah. person. A single person, what I see it as a visualization is that we have a tank and we're filled with love. We're told, oh, the Jews are great. The Jews are like, you know, 67. The Jews are great. You know, like everybody loved us in 67 for a couple of minutes. Um you're filling this up. Our parents fill us up. And then at some point, we're told, you're not worthy. So you're saying that someone bullied you on the bus, so you lose some chips. I see it as little holes. And this stuff that was filled starts to just drain out. Okay. And the bigger the holes, the bigger the trauma, the bigger those holes. And then they start just draining out. So all of us have holes. And we're always leaking. What I like about your framework, mm-hmm. more than the, the poker chip example, is that the poker chip example is very limited in that it's a one-time transaction. Right. And it's 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 given, it's, it's given taken take. back. Right. Exactly. You're you're describing the Kalim. You're describing our vessels for what we're able to deal with for the rest of our life. Right. And when that gets punctured, that has an impact on every interaction after that. Right. Unless Even, that, unless that be, hole is plugged. Right. Meaning like someone give you five thousand chips, but they just leak right out. What I'm saying is a trauma mm-hmm. could, could actually retain, you could retain it in the tank, right? So how do you how do you plug those holes? So ah, such a, so so we so so the first thing that I've experienced and that my frustration with the addiction and recovery community was that there was a huge focus on the car, and this is, mm-hmm. we call it level Stick, one, level yeah. two. There are three levels. S- sticking with the with the sticking with yeah. the marshal, right? We got the fuel the, in the car. The fuel in the car. So there's a lot of focus. Again, we on, talked about a lot of things in between. Mm-hmm. The fuel is worthiness, worthiness, and, and the, the car, car is competence. 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 I could do it. Right. And what I found is that most addicts are have like Maseratis. They got great cars. They have absolute ability to to kill it in the world. I've seen them. As a matter of fact, they're usually super sensitive and creative people and spiritual people, and they have the ability to make it in the world. But what happens is, is that they can't do it because they're running on fumes. So what 
you have the rehabs, we'll say, okay, well, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna train you to go to some very deep therapy. You're gonna work really hard in your therapy and you're going to learn how to make your bed and get up at a certain time and go to a job and do that job right and learn how to talk to the boss and learn. All this stuff is all good. The problem is, is that you're trying to fix up this car and polish this car when there's no gas in the car. So what, what, we, what, we, what I've discovered with all this is that, is that we're focusing on level two when we got to be focused on level one, which is the tank. And the tank is empty. So the only thing I got to focus on, I don't know if you guys follow Avi Fish off at all. He's like yeah. a little bit of a similar yeah, we, methodology. We're, 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 I'm going to have him on soon. Ooh, good yeah. stuff. Okay. So Avi's a good friend of mine and we think kind of similar. He's, I think, a little more extreme than me, but we're pretty close. Um, and he, the focus is 100% on this tank when i'm working on the recovery like we created this sober community our village up yeah. in muncie we spend so much time on shooting unconditional love at each person like you're being completely it's an immersive experience of unconditional love that's what our entire methodology is so people get frustrated by that because i want see movement okay if a guy doesn't have a job in my house even though it's a rule to have a job i don't care because if you don't have a job, it means your tank is empty. It doesn't mean that you don't know how to have a job. And when I fill up that tank, my muscle with my with my staff. So I'll say they'll say like this guy is not making his bed in the morning. He's not making his bed. I said if if you ask him if it's great to make his bed, he would like to make his bed in the morning. What would he say? Oh yeah, I'd love to make my bed in the morning. So why can't he make the bed in the morning? Is always every time because the tank is empty. I do not feel worthy, so I don't do wonderful things. So I, I'm, I'm getting. A, I hope I'm not being too complicated. No, I have, I have a question on it though. Like, yeah, first, it, guys, it really depends on age and everything. But at what point does unconditional love become a free pass to just not be a a contributing member of society? Like well, you, you can't have a like a 35 year old who like. You're just sh showering him with love all day, but the guy is just not, he's not doing anything with that, with that gas. That's true. And that's why, that's why everybody is very motivated to teach him how to do life in these rehabs and the therapeutic programs and all that stuff. They're going to teach him how to do life because a 35 year old can't be acting like a baby. The problem is, and this is what Freud talks about, regression. The problem is if they've been traumatized enough and their life has been killing them enough, their tank is empty. They're essentially babies. I'm in the middle of writing a, a book, which hopefully I'll finish eventually, <laughs> which is called Addicts Are Big Babies. And it's a very mean name to <laughs> a, a book. Good, good title. It's a great title. I can see how you came up with it. Right. Now you understand <laughs> it. Addicts are babies. They're big babies. <laughs> but the thing is, it's very easy to love a baby. You don't have that thought. Like when I see a 35-year-old acting like a baby, yeah. I just want to smack him in the head. Like, yeah. get your act together. What are you doing? You have kids. You have a wife. You have, you have a life. What are you doing? That's our experience around addicts. The thing is, the only thing that works for them is to pull back and realize they're in a dependent state. Who's in a dependent state? A dependent person is a baby. Got to change their diaper. You have to change their diaper. And but when does it get? When do you get them out of that? Well, the secret is this: everybody wants to leave that state, but until it's full, they can't use their car. So what people don't trust is that like, if I keep being a, treat them like a baby, they're gonna stay a baby forever. Right. No, when you treat them like a baby on condition that they start moving, they stay in baby mode. So they'll stay there forever. Like I'll give you a hundred dollars if you go to the store and you behave the way I want it to behave. But if you took that all away yeah, and you just start working on, there are two things, patching the tank and refilling the tank. And that is how I explain it the best I can is that patching it is when they test you. They'll do something so, asinine and terrible <laughs> like to drive you crazy well, you want to murder them <laughs> like there's so many there's, like some of them it would be some of them would be it didn't make his bed but sometimes like i have in the house the sober living everybody knows how to live but like you'll have a guy who'll take out the cookies and they'll just break 10 cookies in half because he likes the, the right side of the cookies and just leave the rest of the cookies on the table this is like a re like a regular human being 
Not an animal, <laughs> just a human being. I'm giving a dumb example. <laughs> not a squirrel. But I'm saying this example. I know that happening. guy, by the way. The yeah, right dude. sides are much better than and the right sides. You can't get half and half cookies, by the way, in a sober living because it's a guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because no one's going to like the black. I can't handle black and white. I can't handle the emotions of a black yeah. part of the cookie. It has to be only the white part of the cookie. Anyway, that'll happen. And then they'll look at you dead in the eye. This is not really what's exactly happening, but they'll look at you and they'll be like, how are you going to respond? Their whole life, everybody's like, what the heck is wrong with you? Yeah. Why are you breaking the cookies in half? Like there are other human beings here. Just have like basic respect. Yeah. These, and, and you, the only way to fix the patch is go, you're still worth it. You're still worthy. And that's going to fix it? A hundred percent. So not only that. But did, you, did you hear embedded in what Sani said is directly the answer to your question, which is, Babies want to grow up. Babies I, yeah. don't want you to keep changing their diaper. Babies don't want to keep crawling. Yeah. They want to put on their pull up and then they want to put on their underpants. And it's the most exciting thing in their world. But you can't. <laughs> no, have you ever toilet race. trained a baby? Yes. You can't motivate them to grow up. That's not the Indian. You has, can't conditionally. Has to come from them. It comes from them. That's the thing is that you don't think so as a result of your unconditional willingness to change their diaper until they need until they don't need you to so, anymore. So like example, the if, only way to stay there. One second. The only way to stay in that space. Yeah. Is if you, if you are so severely traumatized that you can never change your thought from I am unworthy. I am fully unworthy. And that's what we call, by the way, the narcissistic personality disorders, the borderline personality disorders. It's like nearly impossible. So they're like medi you need to help them. There, like maybe medication or a million other things. Okay. I believe that if you put them in a in a loving community that treated them like an hour village. like a baby, and you just kept pounding them with love, no matter how much they tested you, they eventually will start changing their thought process to I'm back to being worthy. We'll be right back to this episode, but first, I want to tell you something about our friends at Collars and Co. You see the shirt I'm wearing right now. This is not a Collars & Co shirt. And sometimes I put this on to remind myself that Collars & Co really have the best shirts. And you're watching this right now. You see this collar is not, it's obviously not a Collars & Co shirt. The collar is literally sleeping. It is not a collar you want to be wearing to some nice corporate event or to wear on a podcast. You know, if you look closely in this podcast that you're watching or listening to, I was wearing a Collars & Co shirt. I was wearing it with a sweater over it. And that collar looks strong and firm. But secret for you, it's a short sleeve shirt. It only has like three buttons. Yeah. You will never tell because I had an awesome sweatshirt over it. But the, the shirt looks so amazing. Anyways, you can get so many different types of shirts at collarsandco.com. Full button down, full sleeve for Shabbos. I wear it every Shabbos. And uh, you want to feel good. You want to look good. That starts at collarsandco.com. Make sure to use promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off. That is promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off at collarsandco. Dot com. Now back to this episode. Have you seen that with like you you have like the best like uh, case studies like you have our village, right? right. Our village is, is a community of, of people becoming sober right. and functioning members of society. Or they're and already sober when they get there, right? It's they get there right after rehab. Okay, so they're right. out of rehab into your community. And are they married? They're single? Some married, some single. Are they there with their spouse or they're without the spouse? No, without the spouse. Okay, they're out there without the spouse. They're living there. Have do you find that people are graduating from our village and integrating back into society, ready to face the world? Yeah, I always matter of fact, I love. I, I mean, it's hard because I don't love statistics. I really think I that, love statistics. I, I know, but I I don't love you when do it comes know? to human beings because uh -huh. then you're deciding who's a success, who's a failure. Like it's like I really think that almost every single person who's gone through this loving community that we've built is some form of success. But it, just in terms of the world. In terms of like the sobriety rate, long term sobriety rate, we're talking two, three, five, even eight year long testing. It's well over 70% of the guys are sober still from my program. There's no program in the world that has numbers like this. And I'm talking about, and in terms of number of people who have jobs, we're in the 90% ratio. Huh. Even guys that are, that are still using on some level, they all have jobs. The guys are getting married. They're doing this now. We're only working with guys. Now we will have girls soon, but I, it's, the success is staggering. So I will have a guy who'll come into my program and literally not get a job for five months, sitting in bed. And most programs would beat him up. And then, and then one of my I heard an interesting tip. Someone asked me to, someone prompted me to ask you. Yeah. 
what type of interventions you do for someone that is unable to get out of bed in the morning. <sighs> oh, you <a> tip? <laughs> someone tipped me off. Tipped you off. Okay, because he wants me to talk about the tea intervention. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a, his intervention that I came up with called the tea intervention. It's a very, it's the letter T? T-E-A? Or no, the word it's T-E-A. T-E-A but okay. if I say it, it ruins the pun. Because it sounds like T, the letter, and it oh, sounds okay. like there's something more to it. But I'll tell you exactly what it is. If a guy doesn't get out of bed, he's all depressed. And, um, it's based on a story that I, that I, I'll tell the story. It was a, a friend of mine, Shua Rosen, runs a program down in Florida. And, um, and he'd call me like he had a guy who's doing all right. And then he just collapsed, stayed in bed, not doing anything. So I said, listen, why don't you try the T intervention? So he said, what the heck is that? You know, like the theater. I said, this is what you do. You go to the kitchen and you make two steaming hot mugs of tea, <laughs> right? And then you go to his room, you give him one of the teas and you take the other tea, you sit on the other bed and you say, listen, I've been here. This is rough. It's really, sometimes you get depressed. Sometimes it's hard. Take your time. Do your thing. Enjoy the tea. I'm going to sit, we'll talk. If you need to be in bed, you can be in bed as long as you want. Just want to let you know I care about you. I love you. You're good. And he said, he like what well, Nahi's saying, like, well, you going to keep giving the guy tea for the rest of his life? And then he called me three days later, like, what the heck? I keep bringing him tea. And it's like, he's still in bed. I said, I, I, you have to give it a week. A week later, the guy is like killing it. Back at work, doing everything. Nobody wants to stay in that baby state most of all the addicts because they've been treated like a baby their whole life in like a bad way, like being potched and punished and they, they don't want to be there. They want to be out. Meanwhile, he just told me that that guy is like getting his graduate degree now, like he's been working for the last like five sponsored years. Sponsored by like, Lipton T. Yeah, sponsored <laughs> by Lipton T. Lipton's oh. the worst. <laughs> it's gotta well, be like one of these herbal teas or something. Now we have like a that. lawsuit on our hands. <laughs> oh no. Um, but what the oh, idea- clearly a tea drinker. I don't I'm drink tea. A, I, what? Oh, I don't drink tea. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like tea? No. Oh. I don't drink coffee either, though. So for you, you'd be, if you were in bed, we wouldn't know what to do for yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> what could we do? I, you met your match. Oh, man. Oreos? There's something. There's something. Oreos? Oreos. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, how about fried Oreos? You ever get the fried Oreos? That's crazy. There's a restaurant in Teaneck that does that. You, did you have it? It's, I, it's amazing. Is it? Yeah. There's that place you that took something that's amazing and you made it fried. <laughs> There's that place it's that like the best fries. Everything. What place deep fries everything? There's a place like deep fries. You could bring them anything. They deep, deep fried fry. ice cream. It's crazy. Yeah, deep fried ice cream. Uh, uh, pickles. You have to live a little. Deep fried pickles are amazing. That's the thing. It's. <laughs> <laughs> what don't you like? That's a good point. I really, actually, I have a funny thing that I do. I have a couple things I don't like to eat, and I every year I have to try them once. Really? Why? Because I because I don't like to live a closed minded life. Where so what's like, this year? So no, I I'm down to like I, I don't love garlicky things. No, I'll I'll eat it. I'll, I mean very very garlic like straight garlic. I don't like. <laughs> you don't eat. <laughs> no, but I used to like not you like, don't like mayonnaise. Straight up garlic. It turned out I like all What's of it. You gotta try that, dude. What's the event? No, I do try it. <laughs> you I eat you garlic, it. like garlic cloves. You'll take it. Like no, usually like they're cooked or whatever. You don't eat straight. You eat straight. Oh, you do on top of like bread or something. You, you like put, garlic bread. I like garlic bread. I like everything now. What I'm saying is like, I got over, I had a, I had like, I couldn't eat mayonnaise. I couldn't eat wow. peanut butter. I got like some good stuff. Yeah. So every year I tried it till I eventually liked it. Wow. Now I, I think I like everything. Like almost everything. That's awesome. I don't like living a life where I walk into a room and there's food and I can't eat it because I don't like it. That, You're that's missing a, a that's a quote great right opportunity. <laughs> that's a, like that, you want that on your Matseva? Yeah. <laughs> I want to tell you something. There's only one thing I'm jealous of the non-Jews is that they could travel without bringing food. Imagine you just going, you're just like, oh, there's a food place. Like, I just go eat Like, you ever go to the mall? Food. Like, you go to the mall and just- You go to the mall, you're like, I like that food. I want to eat it. So Mashiach comes, You like, can't do that. That's going to be Mashiach. Like, yeah. Like, I'm going to Omaha just for not eating all that food. I feel that's you. That's what I said. Welcome you. to Off the Rails. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question. We right, are exactly. unable to see the rails in our rear view mirror at this point. I was getting very serious. It, had, it needed yeah. a little levity. You, you spoke a lot about, I guess, like we're talking about adults, but now like I, I, this might be where our place comes in. Take yeah. like a teenager who's in high school and he's struggling with Judaism for sure, but life in general. And he's throwing off that yarmulke. He's not, he's not, he's not, he's staying in bed. He's not... 
does the same thing apply where you're going to take that 17 year old and you want to just shower him with unconditional love and, and he can act out and do all types of things, but you're just like the te- you're just like giving him whatever he wants and you're hoping that he comes around. Listen, the teenage is a little complicated because teenage, is that our place though? Is that is yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah? Our place is teenagers. Teenage is a little complicated because there are two times in your life where you have natural rebellion. There's twos, the terrible twos, which you guys have been through. I don't know if you have teenage kids. Yeah, threes. But, I find threes are worse than twos. Oh, which whatever. Is my opinion. They call it terrible yeah. twos, but it could be terrible threes. Um, I, yeah, I've had I've had kids like oh I, whew, I made it through the twos, and then the threes were the worst. I know. So yeah, yeah it matters if your kids are moving <laughs> fast enough. I don't if know. Three started with just T. It would be yeah, you just have terrible tea. three dads. It would. It's what I'm saying threes. is that there's a natural inclination for teenagers and two-year-olds because they're supposed to separate from their parents. We naturally, we naturally start saying no. So like a two-year-old, their favorite word is no. And that's their way of saying is you're here and I'm here. I'm not you anymore. That's kind of starting the car. Like I was talking before, like nobody wants to stay in the, in the, in the tank mode. They want to go to the car mode. They're ready to go driving. They got a Maserati. They're ready to go. So the two-year-olds, the way they separate is they say, no, I'm done. Teenagers is the second point of life where we're supposed to be, where we're ready to leave and have our own families. In order to do that, there has to be a form of rebellion. You tell your parents, you're there and I'm here. So to start thinking, you know, I'm talking about something where a tank is empty. There are a lot of teenagers that are totally fine, that are acting like crazy people. That's the thing that's very important to understand. There's a natural inclination to tell your parents to go stuff it. Right. And that's just natural. It's natural. So if we start treating everybody, like I'm talking about an extreme intervention for people who are, their their tanks are empty and they are, they're not doing well. Because of some sort of trauma. If you start doing this with every single teenager, you're, you're, there's no problem yet. So you're like, all of a sudden you're like feeding. So what happens? Because, because again, what, what if like. Let's say there's a school or yeshiva out there that, you know, I personally believe that these types of schools, and there are schools and yeshivas out there that unconditional love, fully give it, you know, that should be the hardest yeshiva to get into. No? Like, the kid needs to, he really needs to have, to, to accept, he needs to be at that level, experience that trauma where he needs that, because if not, kid's never gonna grow up. Well, the interesting thing is I love these yeshivas. I happen to right. love them because no. they're doing wonderful things. But here's the deal. You can put them out of business very simply by just telling the parents to take a chill for five years. I don't need to say it like, like if you, it, what happens is the parents are freaking out that the kids are smoking pot or drinking it. They're supposed to. I don't mean it's a terrible thing to say, but they're supposed to do something <laughs> that really upsets you. They're supposed okay, to listen yeah, to that's music a, that's you a good don't refrain. like. Some that upsets you. <laughs> okay, so now we raise the bar and it's more upsetting to do this and that, whatever. But they they if it, most you know, one of the things like I say about Avi's yeah. Avi Fischoff, he's kind of ruined Brooklyn. Do we have to stop or something? <laughs> no. He kind of ruined Why, Brooklyn. Why? Because you just said Avi no, ruined because, Brooklyn? No, because he, he ruined Brooklyn because all the parents are going, Oh, I don't have to beat up my kid anymore. I could just like let him be in my house and like okay, so he smokes a pot. Look the other way, and then but people don't people disagree with that. Also, you understand the other side. What I'm saying is, you beat up a kid who's in rebellion mode, and he's not a bad kid, but he's in rebellion mode. He's not. He's not even an empty tank. He just wants to fight his parents. Okay, you beat that kid up. That's traumatizing. So what are you supposed to do? Let the kid do whatever he wants? Kind of. What I'm saying is not not. I'm not giving you the full answer to the situation. Has some, you, but no, what, what I want to say? say is this. <laughs> What you do is with a kid like this is you say, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Uh, okay. You, you know, you punish them. Then you realize the bar keeps moving. Okay. So you're not in trouble for every single thing you did before. There's a lot of nuance in parenting a teenager. We're realizing that there's a natural order of things that they need to say, I don't need you anymore and I can move on on my own. So if you start treating everybody like they are an addict, like you know, and Avi Fisher says, I don't take all people. If you have a regular kid in a regular school, I'm just not taking him because he's a normal kid who's doing a little rebellion. So he started listening to music that might not be exactly the music you like. Relax and let the kid get through school. That's basically most okay. situations. What's happening is that we can't handle any type of misbehavior. So we're shipping every one of these kids off into into these yeshivas they don't necessarily need they don't, it they don't need it really i don't think it's hurting them so much because generally they're getting a lot of love 
and they get to misbehave, but they could do it at home. Right, but that love could technically lead them to things that they don't need to be doing otherwise, right? Yes, but I could tell you this. These schools do very, very well for 90% of the people that go to them. Right, no, I hear you. And the ones that, that don't are the really traumatized kids. And then they end up by me. <laughs> what I'm saying is that's like, it helps them. But you don't need these schools if we just integrated this into our lives. Ah, oh, we love you. So you miss Babel, we still love you. Mo, as a parent of six. Yes. With teenagers. Do you have six teenagers? I don't have six teenagers. <laughs> uh, we were blessed with six children. Okay. Um, we have three teenagers now, almost. What do you think about that philosophy? Yeah, well, just yeah. like so uh, it's not really a philosophy. It's very loose. I'm yeah. Just so Naki <laughs> called me out for for being quiet here. I'm mm -hmm. I'm listening. I'm listening, and I'm, I'm curious learning. What you think. I'm learning quite a bit. I don't have a lot of life experience right. in this. Um, in my head, the way I'm receiving what you're saying, um, I thought that the baby muscle was super super helpful for me, and I do shower our children when they're babies with unconditional love. And I've also learned from you that when teenagers are stuck in a developmental phase, they might be babies. And the same way I do believe without having to question that I, I will continue to change my baby's diapers until they can take care of themselves, I'd like to believe that I will continue to shower my children with unconditional love and to advocate that everyone do the same thing in any way that they are still babies. Now, it does require discernment. Right. When is someone being that baby? And when is someone making an excuse? And when is someone doing something else that isn't just requiring that they change their diaper? Now, that requires also love to know your child. The only way you're going to tell the difference, Nahi, between when your kid needs their diaper changed and when they need a, a more firm and stern hand is if you really get to know your kids. Right, right. And I do believe that the only way to have a relationship with kids today is by keeping that door open and having that unconditional love always there so that when they do experience trauma and challenge and difficulty, which is so rampant everywhere, we talked for a, a good amount of time how our whole nation is experiencing trauma. And right. our kids are not insulated from that. So even if it's not getting bullied on the bus, or even if it's not some traumatic, abusive experience, which unfortunately is rampant, but just by being alive today, we're subjected to so much trauma. Right. And if as parents, we're not there for our kids in an unconditional loving way, we're going to miss out on opportunities to have a relationship with them. So, so what is discipline? Right. Does, is, is, there, is there room for discipline on a, on a, on a teenager? Yeah. Whether from yes. a school or a parent. Yeah, listen, you have to realize I only talked about the tank <laughs> and I didn't talk about the car. How yeah. does someone develop a great car? It is by actually Genetics? discipline. But discipline also, like, the way I break it up is that, like, a, the mother is this unconditional love. It's just warmth and love. And that that's, it's a maternal idea. I don't know if it's not always the mother. Sometimes the father is the more loving. and so it's, But it's a maternal idea right. to give super unconditional love. The father's idea is to tell the kid, you're worth it, you're special, you're amazing. In order to do that, there's a couple of things that come in as a father. And you guys are both fathers, so you know. The, you have to tell them both, there are rules, there's structure, life runs this way, and you're able to do these rules and you're able to accomplish them. Also, I let you climb a tree, learn how to cross the road. Mothers are not good at that. Mothers are like, Hold, I'm like no, no, don't, don't let them do that. Don't, and the father's like, you're so good that I trust that you're going to make it in the world. But these are the rules. And we spend a lot of our kids' life teaching them how to do life, how to behave. If someone misbehaves and says something mean to someone else, you show them no, you get punished. You're not, you're not doing that. I, I use the word punished. I don't know if I'm allowed to use the word punished anymore as a, as a therapist, but consequences, whatever it is. But, you know, you, you hit someone with a stick, you're going to get it punished. That's what's going to happen. But all that is saying is that you're amazing, you could do it. So you can't take away that part. The discipline is part of that. You got this. That's part of the father thing. The thing is when you hit the teenage life, there's a mix and that's what you're saying. You gotta really know your kid. But 
Avi Fishov has, oh, I'll quote Avi again. You ready? Avi Fishov has a marshal that he says that you tell someone, if someone's driving the wrong way on a one-way street, you tell them, hey, you're driving the wrong way on a one-way street. Dangerous. So, yeah. Right. It's really dangerous. And it's, and it's against the law. And then, so most people will be like, oh, shoot. Um, okay. Make a K turn and get out of there. You know what I'm saying? Like, they'll figure it out. But then there's like 10% of people that are like, I'll drive any way I want on any street I want. I don't care if I hit someone directly straight on. A lot of them live in LA, though. What? A lot of those people. A lot live of people live in LA. <laughs> it's true. Um, By the way, there are very few. I don't know if you know this. There are very few one-way streets in LA. I'm not kidding. <laughs> all these people are driving. I didn't notes. know what was happening when I came here. With all these in, in Brooklyn, especially, it's confusing. Yeah, I once got pulled over by a cop for turning into like I in the dead end once. Right. And oh no, the dead ends always have to be two. No, ways. they're two ways. Right. No. So I was. I forget what street it was. Oh, maybe I turned on to J off, right? Thinking it was I, thinking it was the dead end, but I was one block premature. Right. So the cop pulls me over and I showed them my California license. And I'm like, dude, there's no one-way streets in LA. I don't know what's happening right. here. Know. And he totally let me off. Right. This is why. There you go. Because that cop probably went to Avi Fischoff. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we will be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. First, a word from an old friend of ours. That is Turo college throw college for men you know it used to be their slogan more right you could do more at Turo. well now it's go further you can go further with Turo's lander college for men base magistral talmud and they are having an open house at 12 45 p.m on november 12th guys it's very simple you want to be at that open house that's the only way you'll find out how you can go further so to find out more about this open house in Turo in general, you can hit the show, hit the link in the show notes in the description of this episode. I'm telling you so many of our guests that have been on this podcast got their start and what they're doing at Turo. Turo does so much work for the Jewish community. They understand your needs as a from Yid and they are doing so much for their students. Um, I've had so many guests, like I said, that, that has started out at Turo, even the professors at Turo. So you can begin your journey and you can go further at Turo by going to their open house on November 12th. That's 12.45 p.m. Uh, you go register for this open house. Show notes, description. Check out that link. Parents, just sign up your kid. You know what to do. Now enjoy the rest of this episode. So what I'm saying is, <laughs> what, but then is if, if your kid, so when your kid is a teenager, you have to say, hey, this is the rules. You got to keep the rules. If you keep saying it 500 times to that kid and the kid's still not doing it, it's not because he's like bad in the head and can't figure it out. He's not listening to you. There's something wrong. And that's when you probably should stop saying you're going really? the wrong so way. Even with like, what, as, even like a three-year-old, four-year-old? Or if, like you tell a kid, don't do this, don't do this, they do it, they do it, they do it, they do it. Unless so, the development is disabled, they figured it out. And so, you got to so, control it. So what do you do? With a kid, you're switching me all over the place. You got kids. <laughs> when you're raising a kid, there's something called chinuch. You have discipline. I got no problem with discipline. What I'm no, but trying stay in to, your stay in your scenario. Right. In yeah. my scenario is when you want to determine who's someone who's got a massive hole in their tank and who's someone who just is misbehaving, you know, you give a consequence. They're like, oh, you took away my phone for the day. Now I'm actually going to behave. If they still, like every time you keep doing it to them, they don't care about the consequences. They're going to keep doing it. That's when you know you're probably dealing with something a little more complicated than just someone who's misbehaving. And the answer for, you're saying is just shower them. With those people, then you got to really start considering how to fix, how to fill their tank. Right. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting marshal because I, I, I realized this a couple of years ago where, where in Judy, this is an ancient Jewish tradition that we've been doing and we didn't recognize it. After someone dies, we have Shiva. Mm-hmm. So like the non-Jewish world does not do Shiva the way we do Shiva. Seems brutal. It yeah. seems brutal. But what happens during Shiva is that we tell these people who just went through the biggest trauma in the world, like, and I believe that's what's happening with us now with the Israel situation. Like we're in middle of trauma, right? Yeah. We're yeah. in the middle of it. So when somebody like loses someone very close to them, they do Shiva. When they get Shiva, it's not like we don't say, hey, dude, get off, get up, go to work, get it. You know, that'll work. You know, everybody in the whole community has to surround you with love. They have to come in. 
There's all these rules about who could talk first. You're not allowed to take stuff away from them. They sit down, they're, gone. they're, not, allowed to, they're not allowed to do certain mitzvahs. They're not allowed to like eat. You literally say, Give them a ton of you're food. in a cocoon. It's like you're a fully grown adult, but right now you're as if you're six months old. All the food is coming to you. Everything is coming. We do not even let them do anything. They can't even go out to work if they want to go out to work. Right. That is the experience that people who are in the middle of trauma, and then by the way, we separated, then there's things that happen in 30 days, things that happen in 11 months, things that happen in 12 months. Like we slowly wean them back into the world after that level of trauma. That trauma hmm. took a big chunk out of their out of their tank. It's a really cool literally muscle. empty. Yeah, them. I, I, I really never cool thought That's about what that. we're doing. You, 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 like, you came up with that. No one else told me it, but I'm saying it's <laughs> it's it's uh, that's really cool. I mean, that's what no, we're he's doing. looking for a citation there. No, I'm just <laughs> saying like that's that's. Uh, There's no citation. I don't. No, know. like that. Honestly, I've that answers that a lot of what like questions I had on your whole thing. That answers a lot of it. Like that's a that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's if you look at Shiva, it's weird. Like, like even after like before the you know the mace is buried, you're not even do a mitzvah. You can't even do a mitzvah. You don't do anything. That's the highest level of trauma. You're in it. Wow. What I'm telling you, when I'm dealing with addicts, they're at that level of trauma all the time. That's where they're at. And the problem is, is that they're adults. And nobody wants to see an adult act like a baby. Mm -hmm. And well, we don't want to treat them like a baby. And also, for it, the, the marketing is different because no one died. Right. It's, everyone's just like, get yeah, your ass together. Yeah, where's your trauma? Where is it? Like, no, nothing happened. And it could be something as simple as uh, my third grade teacher, you know, called them whatever. Right. Trauma's they, tricky. Trauma is very tricky. It's your next book. But the answer, but the answer to trauma is an old Jewish tradition. It's surround them with love. And I, you know, the guys in the house and one of the, one of my staff members called it like, I think I figured out a, a name for your methodology. It's called aggressive compassion. Hmm. Like, it's like, we, we're not, like if a guy's not doing all right, how are you giving him more love? Like the, you know, my staff will be like, this guy's misbehaving. And I'm like, and they don't even want to tell me anymore in staff meetings anymore because I'm like, well, you need to spend an hour with him tonight. <sighs> Every time they misbehave, I got to spend more time with them. That's, yeah. that's the answer. Why would a guy do something that he doesn't want to do? That has been my experience. Now, I believe these things for years and years and years, and I'm yelling into the world and nobody cares because it doesn't make sense that this would work. But then, you know, for the last eight years, we've had, we had these programs and right now there's, you know, there's a hundred people living in Muncie that are like living great lives. You got a hundred people in that village? In the village. Well, the village now it's, it's, it's interesting how it works out. Cause what the idea of it is that it's layers of support. Yeah. So there's all different layers. Like there are guys in the original sober houses, which we have right now we have up to the fifth house, which is guys that actually live in the houses. Then we have people in apartments. And we have people who are married with families that are part of it. And it's just a, basically really cool. you walk in, you're surrounded by love. You it's like even, a real village. It's like a real community. We're trying, but we also, yeah, it's like a real community, but we're trying to have it that it's also in the other community. Like there's actually a guy, I don't know if you heard this guy, Shlomo Reichman. You ever, you ever hear Shlomo, Shlomo Reichman? Reichman? You guys should interview them. Reich or Reichman? Reichman. Shlomo Reichman. Um, he started a program called The Neighbors. Um, and they're helping these guys do this also. Simcha Hyman, you know Simcha Hyman? Yeah. So he did it with Simcha Hyman, and they they are bringing Where my guys- Simcha from? What's Simcha's claim to fame? What's his thing? Simcha does nursing homes, I think, or something. Oh. <laughs> no, something Claimed else. Claim to fame. He's Jewish and he does nursing homes? <laughs> Listen, there are always outliers. That's, weird. That's all I'm saying. You know, That's there's weird. always outliers out there. But innovator. He, he yeah. said, "Yeah, he do something different." He's like, "I don't care. <laughs> I, even though I'm Jewish, I'm still going to do nursing." Good. Games. I don't even care. Wow. <laughs> he must have experienced some serious right. trauma. Sometimes you just got to break free of the stereotype. Sometimes you got to just you got to just break free. Um, How far can we take this? Do you have anything else? Uh, that, far. That, that, far. that far. That far. We're there. It. That was it. Um, no. So. It, it, so they started another program called the neighbors yeah. and that that takes my guys and puts them into that gets them connected to all the volunteers in the community that are all like balabatham doing living their good lives and they're another layer of support also i have shuls a couple of shuls around that are like super supportive and connecting to the guys so it's not just the guys in the community it's like really putting them out they also work by the people and like everybody's working for each other so like they all get jobs with the guys so it's, Ideally, the whole world should be like this. Right. So we're trying to do. So my belief is that we're. This is 
when I when you asked a question before and I went global, like why is this a problem? Is that I think our sense of community is broken down. We're not in a place where we all need each other. Like we had, like when you look at third world countries, they're actually happier. Like all the studies show them to be happier because they're stuck in communities. Now they're going through horrible stuff. They're starving, they're, you know, but they all need each other. So everybody in that community is worthy. Everybody needs each other. Everybody is connected. My cleaning lady was telling me that that uh, like in her community, like when they would, then they were very broke. Everybody would chip in and buy like this one would get an oven this month. This one would get a fridge. Everybody had to do it together. Like that's how the community was. And they built resilience that way because everybody ended up with a strong sense of worthiness. And the worthiness comes from the community, all the people around you loving you. So a lot of the stuff that I'm frustrated with is this idea of like the talk of self-love. Like in, in therapy. Like so we really need, to you, self-love is like awful then. No, we it's need not, love from others. We should have self-love, but self-love is level two. Right, level one is- I mean, when a guy yeah. comes in, they say, oh, well, if he doesn't want it, I can't help him. He needs help now. Our place, we take guys that are actively using drugs, actively acting out, and we're just pounding them with love. We're just like tons and tons of love until the tank starts filling up enough, and then we can get them a job, get them a work, get them, get them back to school, get love them Love them until they can love themselves. Right, so it's before they even know. The first stage of getting better is not on them, it's on us as a community. The Shiva idea is like, they, we're not saying like, get up. Imagine how weird it would be to tell a guy, get up, go to work, it makes you better. Like that's, that's- That's the equivalent. That's the equivalent. So we're telling all these addicts who've been broken for years, they've been telling you, they've been telling us, we're broken, we have nothing, we're acting like babies. And we're saying, no, nah, you're not a baby, you're an adult, start acting like an adult. We're just gonna keep telling them that. And that's why they keep relapsing over and over and over again. I'm getting depressing, tell me. I, I, no, I it makes, it really make you honestly like- You got him on the Shiva muscle. I think you changed my mind. I got the shit, the Shiva, I saw the shit. Yeah, you got him, you got him at the Shiva I think you changed muscle. my mind. But here, my question for okay. you is, how do you, how are you able to discern the difference or, or know when, oh, this, this person is not the baby. This person's just looking for some free love and doesn't really need it. They just want the good stuff. What good stuff? Like who wants to be a baby? I really, I don't meet too many people like this. I mean, like, I don't meet- You're saying the person who- Like, if you're a healthy person, you don't want to give out. You want handouts. I don't want to give a handout. A 15-year-old? 15-year-old kid, you know, after a little while, it's like, it's embarrassing to be treated like a baby. Like, I don't experience it. Like, when people are coming to you and they're like, acting like, like, I need, I need more and more and more. What's wrong with you that you need so much? Like, what's this gaping hole in you? It's like you started with like, why do all the therapists and all these people doing awesome things, like why do they all come from a hard place? Because there's something wrong. <laughs> there's a gaping hole in that person that's trying to figure out how to fill it. So luckily, that's how we have therapists. <laughs> they're all broken and they're filling it by helping other people. And whether they, I don't think it's a bad thing, I think it's wonderful. But that's, that's when we're broken, we need to try to fill it. So I don't meet too many people who are just looking for handouts. Right. It's embarrassing. What's the most embarrassing thing you can do is imagine walking around shul and asking people for money. Like, it's really hard to do that. I worked with a guy who like did that for like, like for a living, I should say. And like, he did it for years and years and years and he still had to psych himself up in the morning to go out and like ask people for money. And this is what he does for a living to stay alive. Like, it was interesting therapy because I had to like help him like get to a place where he could go out and beg. Like hype him up. Yeah, like, you know, like get the right methodologies, you know, using behavioral methods to get out there and beg for money. But what I'm saying is that nobody wants it. Nobody so really wants it. What I'm saying is they were I don't know that I met people like that. You have a lot more experience than I do. Yeah, I don't meet too many people like this. You have it for a little while, like, like teenagers are acting kind of bratty. But if you keep giving it to them, they, they eventually they're like, ew. Feels gross. Stop. Yeah. Like, why are you Mom. doing it? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I feel you. Like, we just did an hour and 15 minutes, by the way. Did we? Yeah. I told you I could do three hours. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> um, Sonny wow. Perlman, like that, you really like, I'm not a huge believer in people having the ability to like talk and change someone's mind. Especially nowadays, you see what's going on in the wow. world. Like people are yeah. on, on their side of the thing and like 
my wife's like, you're not changing anyone's mind on Twitter. Like, you're not changing their mind. If they think Hamas is good and Israel's bad, like, you're not changing that person's mind. Also, she's right about that, dude. She, you're not, right? Really yeah, on Twitter, like, you're not. It really does. You know, even face like to face, you. you're not. You think so? No, oh, if you sit down and have a conversation like this and open your mind and open your heart and let someone talk to you, you can grow. Yeah. It's a, it's a scary world. We gotta get married to our ideas. Like they just get, they get locked in. So we shouldn't do that. And the beauty of me in this field is that I tried the other way. My training is like actually to do all this tough love and stuff. That's where I got trained. I became a drug counselor. In, I went to school in 99. I mean, they didn't have the love talk then. Right. It wasn't like a discussion of that. It's, it's that was my training and I watched it not work over and over. Parents call me and they're so frustrated. They're like, I keep telling him to get up and go to Shachar's and he's not going. And I'm like, stop. <laughs> Come up it's with chill. another method. It's chill. No, I'm saying chill. I'm just saying is that that's not working. That's what I felt like in my whole field. It's like we were sending people to rehab, rehab, rehab. People are spending $100,000 a month in some of these programs. And the guys walk out and use that day. I'm like, what are you doing? This person has to be filled with enormous amounts of love for the next year before he's getting better. He's been broken for years. Speak to any addict, you're going to find out that they've literally been traumatized since they're very young. So I'm talking about the high-level addicts. I'm only I'm talking about it as like an addict because I when I say addict I mean like 75% right, right, right. or not but like it that was more of like a I feel you. Well, thank you for for I think sharing. another thing that's yeah. worth saying is that we're not having I know it took on this like form mm -hmm. where you were like debating a topic and then like Nahi like understood your point and like came around and then like acknowledged like the the evolution of thought. I didn't even know that was happening by the way. I think that's sort I of was organically just, just like talking emerged. about it. <laughs> but Naki was going through the whole crisis in his head. I, I don't know what was happening there. I missed it all. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> but I think more than that, th this is not a, a topic to debate intellectually. You are in the trenches of this work yeah. happening. And yeah. this is not a theoretical conversation, but this is a this is a reality that is playing itself out within Klal Yisrael, and you are in the trenches doing this work. And for someone that might not have as direct exposure to these, to these people, to these neshamas, to these chelik alakami mal mamish, who are you are working with on a daily basis, filling up their gas tank with love, for people that are just treating this as information that they can intellectually decide whether they agree or disagree with, that's one experience. But a different one is to know and to just trust that you, God bless you, you are doing God's work with right. God's children and you are in the trenches and showering these people with love and with enough love until they love themselves and ashrecha. And that's the, that's the important thing. That's why I'm like really a little against the addiction word is that you have kids and, and you, all you guys have kids. There are points in your kid's life where they need Shiva. Like they're going through a tough time. They got bullied on the bus. And you're like, get your idea to get out there. It's not about babying them, giving them. It's about they need you right now. Mm -hmm. They're going to borrow your hope. They're going to borrow your belief in them. They're going to borrow that from you so that they have the strength to make it to school the next day. So what I'm saying is like we're treating this like only addicts get this idea. It's everybody. There were literally, like you said, and I said this week, there were times when I wish there was a big, huge mama in the sky that was like, would hold me so for, the next, for two days. Like, give me tea in bed. Like, that's what I wanted. And, and, you know, I don't always get it. So we have to surround ourselves with our own community. I created, I know you guys are done, but I created um, um, something called Mivaksham Anonymous with my friends. I have a bunch of friends. We have six, seven friends. We get together once a week and we just share and we're there for each other and we're like each other's community. We're like all married people with kids. I happen to be the oldest out of the group, but everybody's like raising little kids and and it's just sometimes we just feel empty. Like no one's filling our tank. So we meet once a week at least and sometimes we will go to like a schwitz together or something like that. But we just sit and talk 
And we, we, we share about what's going on. And sometimes it's bad stuff. Sometimes it's good stuff. It doesn't matter. We're filling each other's tanks. What I'm saying is this is not just an addiction thing. It happens to be Life. that addicts are like, like a caricature of our worst day. Like that's what they look like all the time. But we all feeling this. And I'm saying it was well, if I can fight for anything, we see what's happening in the community when this whole Israel thing is happening is gorgeous. We're getting together. We love each other. We're holding each other. Day of love they did it's yesterday or Sunday, or whatever. Yeah. Like that's what we need. We need a sense of community. And it's pretty horrible that it takes like the Palestinians to wake us up to that. But we you gotta do this all the time. You gotta do it all the time. We gotta hold on to it now. And the more broken we are, the more love we need. And and then we get back up and we can move. And that that is all how we're all feeling. So if I could like say one thing is that this is not exclusive to addicts. This is all of us. And look at your kid and see, is this an empty tank today? It could be today. There are like when you lose a, a member of your family, your tank goes from from 80% full to, to zero. You don't have any strength. I, I don't know if you ever lost anybody, but like you're just gone. It's empty. There's nothing left. If you had to do life now, you just couldn't do it. You just couldn't do it. And I see people who like have go through major traumas. They'll immediately start doing addictive behaviors right afterwards. You see this with senior citizens a lot, which is fascinating. You lose a spouse. All of a sudden they're like using drugs and alcohol. You actually see it. It's like a little hidden world that no, not too many people know about. I know about it, but I'm saying it's like, it's a little weird world. But when we're traumatized, we're hopefully act- not in any of Simcha's nursing homes. No, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. But what I, what I say is that you got to look. Only love Simcha. You got to look at your kid. And they'll be like, hey, hey, like, is this a day that he needs the extra love? And I'm not talking about giving out prizes. That's fine. You can give out prizes. They just need a hug. They need like the holding. Sound like a hippie now. <laughs> no, you're good. One love. <laughs> One love. Sonny Promo, thank you so much for, thank you. for coming on the pod. It was awesome. Thanks for inviting me, guys. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Once again, we have a Meaningful People podcast WhatsApp channel. A lot of news updates clips are being posted there throughout the week so go ahead and hit the link in the show notes in the description of this episode we really really appreciate all the feedback that you guys leave so you leave a comment on youtube i personally go through it and if you see a reply it's coming from me like literally so please leave a comment on youtube i will reply to your comment uh like this subscribe to our youtube channel it really makes a difference helps us you know reach more people with this podcast and i think especially this episode can help a lot of people you know, trauma, addiction, recovery. If you enjoyed this episode, I look forward to hearing your feedback. You can email me today at nachi at meaningfulminute.org. And I can't wait to bring you another episode with the Meaningful People podcast. Thank you.